Yeah, that was, that's encouraging. Okay, so um, as was mentioned, I, I am um, running an experiment at Woods to try to connect Stanford more closely with um, energy and policy challenges uh, that are being worked on in, in real policy processes, in, in, primarily in the United States, primarily at the state level. Um, we played an important role and are continuing to play an important role in the extension of cap and trade in California um, and in the discussions around the regionalization of the electricity market. And I'll touch on those in, in my remarks, but I just kind of wanted to structure this around sort of three big policy challenges that we see as important, important for Stanford students to be thinking about and thinking about how they might conduct research. Um, if you're interested in working with us, coming and talking to me about getting involved if you have bandwidth and time. Um, and, I, and I should add that you know, the work that we've done to date um, has, has really been a, a collaborative effort between faculty and students. Um, a number of students were incredibly important in work we did for Senator Whitehouse a few years ago. More recently, um, I ran a, a small practicum that assisted the environmental justice community in engaging more effectively in the cap and trade conversations in California. Um, and a number of he Iver students last year, um, under my, where I played an advising role, were really engaged in the process in the state of Virginia and the Commonwealth um, in helping Governor McAuliffe think through the options for reducing carbon in the electricity sector um, there uh, in the absence of a clean power plan option, right? And, and that process is still playing out. We're still engaged with Virginia um, executive branch officials on this question. But, but I just want to highlight sort of what I see as sort of the three of the big challenges um, that are right now uh, and, and maybe a little bit further down the line um, that, that matter for the energy system um, in the United States. And, and, and of course, more generally at the international level as well. Although the challenges are somewhat different when you go to that scale. Um, the first is cutting emissions, cutting greenhouse gas emissions. How to do that, how to do that cost effectively, how to actually design and implement programs that can survive the political process and yet are effective. And this is not as simple as it sounds, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward to to um, identify kind of a science-based target. This is what we need to do to avoid two degrees C warming. Probably many of you have heard conversations like that. It gets a lot more challenging when uh, you go to a state legislature and you say, well, what would we have to do to achieve that within this state? What are the economic impacts going to be? What are the engineering challenges? What about um, the, the legal challenges that might come up if we want to do this in our state, but we have a neighboring state that feels differently, right? How can we prevent um, dirty electricity or dirty products produced in a, in a less uh, clean way from just substituting in by being shipped across the state border? These kinds of questions are important. Another one that's becoming really important, and we saw this, there's a recent DOE study, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is just the challenge of integrating renewables. As we move beyond renewables playing kind of a, you know, a bit part in the power sector. And there are a number of really important legal questions that have to do with the design of the electricity system, and, and importantly, how generators get paid, um, whether they get paid via a market, or whether they get paid via state policy decisions, which are subject to all the usual things that happen when you have a, a regulatory body making decisions as opposed to a market-based outcome. And these cut in a, this cuts in a lot of directions, but I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and then this, this question of a really important question that, that, that um, folks who have worked on regulated industries, industries like the power sector, um, worry about is, is just managing risks during that transition. If we actually can achieve a transition to a clean, you know, low carbon, clean energy economy, right? Is that transition going to happen via a series of really disruptive events, right? Like giant bankruptcies and 
what are called stranded costs, but basically you know, liabilities being socialized, being placed onto the backs of either taxpayers or ratepayers or somebody. Right? Think about the financial bailout. Right? That's when we had this giant problem and we had to spend a trillion dollars. Well, had to. We did spend a trillion dollars to buy our way out of it. That's one way to get out of a problem where you've built up a lot of risk in a system and then the whole thing blows up. But maybe there are better ways, and especially if we plan ahead, maybe we can avoid spending that trillion dollars. And so thinking through that problem, the, the legal issues, legal aspects of that problem, the economic issues, and the policy aspects of that problem is a really important question as well. So I just, I like to, that's enough talking with words. This is just a picture to show you why the, the greenhouse gas emissions issue is, is, a, is a really challenging one. So this is a picture that shows, I wonder if I have a little, I do have a little pointer. Um, that shows in black our, um, well, ARB's estimate of California's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, this is a little bit dated. We actually have 2015 data now that kind of continues on a trajectory slightly downward, um, but it's basically where that green line is. Um, and in red is the target that was set by um, legislation, AB 32, which is kind of a famous piece of legislation around here. Um, it's the first circle. In the second red circle is the 2030 target, SB 32. That was a bill that was passed last year, kind of Fran Pavley's swan song before she was termed out of the legislature. And you can see that to get from where we roughly are to 2020 is like some work, but that's doable work, right? Cutting emissions 2 million tons a year in an economy that produces something like 430-ish million tons of CO2 per year is like a problem that policymakers can probably solve at relatively low cost. You know, we can do some energy efficiency, we can get some EVs out on the road, the cafe standards will do a little work. We can have a really aggressive RPS that's driving fossil generated power out of the system as much as possible, and we can get there. The problem is this, right? This is 2020 first of all, is not far away, particularly when we're talking about long-lived capital infrastructure, right? capital-intensive infrastructure like electric power. And somehow, California says, we're going to get here by 2030. We're going to basically increase by a factor of 10 the rate at which we're decarbonizing the economy. That's a huge challenge. It's particularly a huge challenge because we have to somehow achieve that having already done the easy stuff. And it hasn't been that easy, right? The, the things that California has done to reduce its emissions have been politically controversial, sometimes expensive, um, and required a tremendous amount of work on the part of the regulators, but also on the part of all the companies that have to comply, right? And so now we're saying, okay, that's great. Get us to there, and then do 10 times as much. And it's also challenging because the, we're going to run out of the easy stuff to do. Right? So, so far, this, this is the recession. So we did a lot of work reducing emissions by having a giant economic recession. But what's notable is that the economy recovers, starting around here, you know, the economy's been recovering and emissions are flat. That is a real accomplishment of policy, of structural change in the economy too, of low natural gas prices too, but, but policy's in there somewhere in the mix driving change. But, this is, you know, keeping things flat while the economy grows is not going to get us to our 2030 target. And so that's going to be a real challenge. And I'll just tell you that this is a bigger delta than there are power sector emissions in California. And the power sector is where we've seen reductions so far. So what this implies is we need to do hard things in transportation over the next decade. We've never been able to do that before. We've never successfully accomplished really dramatic reductions in transportation CO2 emissions. We need to do really hard things in a sector, if you think transportation is hard, that's actually the easy part of the problem. The really hard part of the problem, the problem also where this community can really contribute, is in figuring out how to cost effectively provide process heat to industrial applications. Right? The only way we have for generating heat inputs to industrial processes now basically involves burning fossil fuels. Now, either we need to capture the carbon when we do that, which I'll just tell you is 
currently really hard and really expensive, and there are a few pilot projects that haven't gone so great. Um, look up something called Kemper County and, and Southern Company, and you'll see what I mean. Um, but huge challenge. Huge challenge, particularly in California. Another alternative would be like a small modular nuclear reactor. That's illegal in California until we have a long-term solution to the nuclear waste storage policy, or pr problem, I should say. Um, so this is a huge challenge. It's one that we all need to be thinking about, the engineers, the, the lawyers, the economists, trying to figure out how we achieve this or even something close to this over the next decade. And I should say, this is the science-based target, right? 40% below 1990 emissions levels is what the science tells us we need to be doing. If you can't do that in California, a rich, progressive state, you're not going to be doing it anywhere else, right? So this is, California is the place where we demonstrate proof of concept. And it's incredibly important that we get this right here. Um, so another challenge that I mentioned is just this problem of integrating renewables. As renewables become really important to the um, energy, the electric energy supply in the, in the mix that we use in the grid. This is a famous figure that keeps getting recapitulated. It's called the duck curve. I think it sort of looks like one of those swans you get at a restaurant when they wrap up, like fancy restaurant foil swan. You ever seen that? But I don't see it as a duck, but whatever. Um, and it basically just shows what people who run grids call net load. So this is the shape of the demand for electric power after you correct for the non-dispatchable resources, solar and wind, over time. And what you can see is that it's been going down and down, and there's this shape to it that's really challenging. Very low load here, and then this really fast ramp in the afternoon. And how we manage that problem is super complicated. And it, it takes up the time of engineers and lawyers and uh, regulators and economists who think about electricity at this point. One of the ways we're talking about managing it is basically increasing the size of our grid. Right? This is a map, this, this yellow thing here is, the, is the, basically the grid in California. It's the, it's the balancing authority for California that balances load with supply of energy and operates a wholesale energy market to kind of make that work and provides ancillary services. All these other things in different colors here are different other balancing authorities in the western United States that are starting to hitch up with California to run something called an energy imbalance market. And this is kind of the just dipping a toe in the water of, of growing the grid in the west. And that's really important for California. Right now, when net load gets really low, we're starting to have to tell solar plants to turn off, right? To curtail their generation, especially in the springtime, because there's just too much solar energy and we don't have anywhere to put it, right? We can't store it, we don't have batteries. We, and so the question of kind of how to do this right, um, how to do this right and recognize we're getting married to Pacific Core, Idaho Power, these entities that are in states where the issue is not subsidizing renewables, it's how do we subsidize our coal-fired power plants and keep our coal miners employed, right? We gotta do this right, or we risk undermining some of our other energy policy goals. This is a really interesting problem that I hope folks around here in this room will be interested in working on while you're at Stanford, and it's something that we're engaged in as well. Um, lastly, I wanna talk about managing the risks. This is a picture of something that probably none of you looking around, maybe there's some older students here have heard about or heard of. Conrail was an entity that was created basically when the railroad industry went bankrupt. And it was created, it was, a, it was this entity that was a nationalized all the assets of these large railroads in the, in the eastern United States that had gone bankrupt because they'd been run into the ground by the combination of regulation by something called the Interstate Commerce Commission, which doesn't exist anymore, but it did back in the, you just take my word for it, um, economic regulation that didn't take account of emerging forces of competition, right? What do railroads compete against? They compete against trucks. They compete against barges. They compete against all air freight, right? And for a long time, the regulators just couldn't deal with that. It was, it was a very difficult challenge, and it got so bad 
that the railroads all went bankrupt. And they had to be nationalized. Penn Central was at the time that Penn Central bankruptcy was the largest bankruptcy ever in US history. And it was enormously disruptive, particularly for an industry right, that's critical. If you want to keep the electric power plants on in most of the United States, you got to have rail because you got to deliver coal. right? And certainly at this time, that was true. Um, less true now. Um, and the, you know, the, the key issues here are how to understand, how to reinvent the utility business model so we don't repeat this mistake in electric power. And that's a topic that I work on, that a number of other researchers at Stanford work on from, from different disciplines. But it's a place where um, this is, this is this, being in California in particular, where we have more distributed energy almost than anywhere else in the country on a percentage basis, maybe other than Hawaii, um, is a particularly good place to be asking these questions. Right? We need to avoid a second PG&E bankruptcy. That may make you all, you sort of may go, huh, that makes me feel twice old in this conversation. But um, these are the kinds of challenges, the regulatory challenges that integrate with economics and with engineering solutions that facilitate utility participation in solving this problem, right? That we have an old system, an old regulatory system. This is the formula. The revenue requirement for the utility is, is equal to the rate base of the utility times its rate of return plus its operating expenses. How do we manage this very old system, a 19th century system, as we move into a 21st century electricity world environment and avoid this? Right, where the taxpayers pick up the tab for the financial disaster. So those are the kinds of things that I'm interested in working on um, and that we're working with policymakers on right now um, in California, in Oregon, in Washington, in Virginia. Um, and I'll just say that you know, the engine that makes that work happen is students. And so um, come talk to me if you're interested in these questions if you want to engage you know, really directly in trying to solve these kinds of problems. Um, there are a number of other people. I see one of them sitting in the back of the room there, Diane Grunick, who's a former PUC commissioner and uh, is, is very much involved in this conversation at Stanford and in California and with regulators across the country as well. There are a number of us that, that want to engage. And um, I would just encourage you to reach out, to think about these big problems when you're at Stanford, um, and to think about how you can craft your work to, to be relevant. Because the challenges are now. They're not, this is not a long-term thing. We have to make choices now that are gonna drive whether we, we navigate this, this kind of tricky rapid <laughs> that we're headed into in the power sector in particular, or whether we end up on the rocks. Um, so I'm happy to take a few minutes of questions if people have them. Um, uh, it's going to be uh, coal, oil, natural gas, social energy, but employment intensive. I'm not sure how employment intensive renewable energy will be. So how do you think the transition will be with respect to managing jobs? Because jobs are important. Yeah, 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 that's a great question. So um, one thing to say is that uh, renewable energy is actually adding skilled blue collar jobs at a much faster rate than uh, the oil and gas industry is losing jobs, is shedding jobs. Oil, gas, and coal, fossil is shedding jobs. Coal mining is a, is, used to be a labor intensive activity. We have that image of it. But the reality today is, well, my son, my five year old son has this truck that's like a, like a Tonka version of a, of a coal mining truck that you'd see in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. But his version you know, is yay, and the real one is six stories tall. Right? And one person drives it, and it takes coal from a thing that can fill 10 of these an hour, or probably more, that is operated by one, person, one other person. Right? And, and a lot of these industries are squeezing the labor out. The nice thing about distributed energy is that it just, you know, you need, until Amazon, there was a great, April Fool's thing about uh, a while back from an energy blog about Amazon inventing you know, robot aerial deployment of distributed solar energy. Until that happens, um, you know, the drones come to distributed energy. Yes, you need a lot of people. Um, and so the facts on the ground demonstrate that, right? Solar in particular is adding jobs much faster 
than, and these are the kinds of jobs that are needed. Now, now I don't want to minimize the challenge. The real challenge is, what do you do in Wyoming, right? A place where coal mining has been kind of the heart of the economy for multiple generations, and where America as a nation asked Wyoming to make that commitment, right? Carter said, we're going we're gonna to burn coal. It's a domestic energy resource. We don't depend on Middle Eastern countries that are subject to lots of geopolitical risk to get coal. So Wyoming, go dig up your coal. And we're going to facilitate that happening. Miners, go to work. If you get sick, we're sorry, right? But this, is, this was a national commitment. And, and how do we help those communities transition? That's a much harder problem. Uh, and I don't want to minimize it. But I think in the net, at the national scale, the picture is pretty good. In a hypothetical world where the federal EPA is no longer the highest level of study policy, what are some of the values and risks? Hypothetical. hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are some of the values and risks you see of states now being the highest level of government set policy? Yeah. Are, there, are there frameworks that are developing that are patchwork, or is there more? Is there more innovation coming from states working individually? I think there's a lot of innovation that reflects the different circumstances that states face um, because of their legacy investments, because of their just their uh, the resources that they have to bring to bear on the problem. Um, the the risks I foresee, and I think the challenge is going to be, you know, the, the, the development of a patchwork. Um, and 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 the reality in energy is we already have a patchwork. We've always had a patchwork. States play an incredibly important role in in developing energy resources, and they always have. And that's kind of the federalist system we live in. We don't have a national energy policy, and we probably never will. We might have a national climate policy at some point in the future. Um, the, or I guess we do now. It's, we don't care. Um, the, the, the challenge is going to be that at the point where we get to another conversation at the federal level, the states that want to do things will have done them and gone further down a track that's very different from the states that don't want to do things. Countering that, at least in the power sector, is the fact that the economics are really shifting. Where now, you know, even in Georgia, right, in Georgia Power's recent integrated resource planning efforts, they have said explicitly solar is the least cost resource for them, right? And Georgia Power doesn't come to that out of like a bleeding heart, you know, concern about climate change. They're, they're looking at hard numbers and making an objective determination about what's best for ratepayers. And so I think you know, that that's to some degree counters it in the power sector. But the power sector, as I said, is not enough. And it's not where emissions are growing. And it's not where we need them to fall most urgently. And in the, in the uh, transport sector, it's where the biggest challenges lie ahead because oil is not going to get expensive again. right? People already in the Permian are locking in three-year hedges at less than 50 bucks a barrel, right? So they're saying, I can profitably sell oil at less than $50 a barrel. And so that tells you that oil is just not going up. I mean, absent some massive disruption in the shale industry, um, it's not happening. And so that transportation is going to be the big challenge, I think. And, and there, we're going to see real divergence. And getting everyone back on the same page is tougher once that happens, right? The Clean Air Act was passed kind of where, in this context where California had taken some bold steps, had a huge air pollution problem. And before everyone went down the California road, the Fed stepped in and said, hold on, we need a national program to regulate vehicles, because vehicles are, are a national product. And the challenge is going to be that we may get to that fragmented situation before we have federal supportive federal policy. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, so uh, while we were talking about the greenhouse gas emissions and charges for the for California, now my question was that, I mean, the recent withdrawal from the Paris Agreement by the federal government, does that pose any additional challenges to export? Um, no. That's the short answer. Calif you know, it, it, the, the Paris Agreement, well, first of all, we haven't withdrawn. We have announced our intent to withdraw. 
And intentions can change. You never know, particularly with the person who sits in the White House right now, and particularly with whoever might replace him. Um, so it's an intent. But in addition, the clean air regulations in the United States have long held, have long said that states can do more. If they want to have, if a state wants to have cleaner air than is required by the Federal Clean Air Act, they are at liberty to create that outcome. They can't do less, right? The Clean Air Act is a floor. How bad can things get? No worse than the Clean Air Act requires. And even sometimes it is worse, but implementation is imperfect. But states can certainly aim higher. And so California is on pretty clear legal ground to aim higher. Um, and that's even true, it's actually more true, the more the federal government steps away from doing something about greenhouse gases. Where things can get tricky is if the federal government is doing a lot, and maybe there, you know, there are aspects of that where there might be some preemption. But the less the federal government does, the more a state like California can do. Thanks. Thanks for your time. <laughs>